Uh, our next speaker is John Pelletier, who's going to be talking about um, modeling impacts of vegetation changes on landscape evolution. I want to thank James for the invitation to come and speak. Thank you. I'm going to be provocative in my first slide and, and propose that hillslope fluvial geomorphologists have often taken climate change to be synonymous with changes in runoff, discharge, precipitation, some combination of those things, i.e., the driving shear stresses of the landscape. And I'm going to show you some examples and hopefully convince you, at least in these, this subset of cases, that common vegetation cover changes can lead to changes in erosion rates and topographic attributes that are an order of magnitude larger than changes in driving shear stresses. So the resisting strength of the landscape, the anchoring effect of vegetation in particular, can be much more important than those driving stresses, which in my sense uh, can, is, is typically emphasized. So just some examples of motivating data from the last century from the real literature. This is Mark Melton, excuse me. This is Mark Melton from 1957, looking at drainage density, primarily in Arizona and New Mexico. There's some variation in precipitation, mean annual precipitation uh, in these regions, but the primary impact on drainage density as you go from relatively uh, forest-covered environments to relatively bare environments, there's a two-order of magnitude increase in drainage density. Uh, this is an example of anthropogenic change from Dunn, 1979, working in Africa. So he showed that at a given mean annual runoff, anthropogenic changes in vegetation cover can lead to order of magnitude changes in sediment yields. So vegetation is clearly important, and some of the things I'm going to touch on in this talk follow upon an NSF-sponsored workshop that was held in Tucson a few years ago, and there's a publication that came from that effort. Many of the people who are here in this room were also present then. And, um, and I thank you for your participation. I just want to um, highlight a couple of things about this particular thing. So the question we posed was about forecasting the response of Earth's surface to future climatic and land use changes. This is a review. In particular, they, we spent a lot of time on what ended up being a supplement, but a very long and comprehensive supplement that goes process zone by process zone and demonstrates what we think is our current capability to make forecasts and also what the, the knowledge gaps are. So if you read the paper, there's actually a supplement that has a lot more detailed information than you might be interested in. And this is just some three points from, from the, the, the 10,000 foot view, from the large scale view that, that we wanted to emphasize in this paper. Number one, that geomorphic response is the vegetation cover is a key knowledge gap for all the process zones, for whether you're working on hill slopes or sand dunes. It's important, and it's, in some cases, uh, the vegetation cover effect is dominant. Number two, generating reliable forecasts for the future requires that models be validated. Successful hindcasts are essential, obviously. And so for a future talk, I'm actually going to be spending a lot of time in the distant past in this particular talk. And I hope that's okay, but it's, it's, it's coming from this motivation. Uh, and finally, geomorphologists should collaborate more with their system modelers. And that's sort of an obvious thing, but it requires that we move to a larger scale than we are typically used to working with, uh, working at as a community. So I'm going to try to touch on and provide some examples of all three of these things. I'm going to draw primarily from my own work. I apologize in advance for that, but it's work that I know best, and I'm not suggesting that other work isn't equally good. So in terms of vegetation changes that have impacted the landscape in a major way, one example is the glacial granite glacial transition or the Pleistocene to Holocene transition in the southwestern United States. Forests were at 800 meters above sea level at LGM, and they're currently at 1,800 meters above sea level. So there's been a shift of one kilometer in the biomes in the southwestern United States. Elevation is king. You can go from Mojave to Sonora to the Chihuahua, and you get slight differences in those elevations. But these are the key numbers, and they impact a huge proportion of the landscape. So I've taken my home state of Arizona as an example. This is the Grand Canyon. Everything below, uh, everything that's in blue is below 800 meters above sea level. Everything that's in orange is above 1,800 meters. So two-thirds of the state or more is in this region that's come back and forth between forested and non-forested conditions roughly 20 times within the quaternary. This is important geomorphically. How do I know this? Well, we have a really nice database uh, of elevation-specific paleovegetation in the southwestern United States and other area, area, area areas around the world. 
These are pack rat bins. They are ingesting seeds of plants within their range, which is about 100 meters from their den, and they're building up these middens. These are deposits of feces that are, that are essentially a stratigraphy. They are radio radiocarbon datable back to 50,000 years, and they, they're elevation specific. So rather than a lake core or some other geologic record that's, uh, that's integrating over a large airshed, this is specific to this one place, and that becomes very valuable. So in terms of modeling, my model framework that, I'm gonna, that's, that underlies a lot of the examples that I'm going to talk about today looks something like this. I'm defining erosion as being a po an erosion rate as being positive if the material has been removed. And so the erosion rate is equal to the divergence of a volumetric unit sediment flux. This is a colluvial term. This is a fluvial term. So when I'm in the channels, this is channel flow. And when I'm up on the hill slopes, this is overland and real flow. That's this component right here. So there are some topographic terms. You know, typically when we're doing colluvial sediment transport, we have some type of nonlinear diffusion model. There's a diffusivity sitting out in front. And in the transport limited case, and I'm a believer that in most soil mantle landscapes, it depends on soil texture, but I believe that most soil mantle landscapes are in fact transport limited, which is a little bit more difficult to model computationally, but I think it's worth doing in most cases. And so the divergence of the fluvial sediment flux looks something like this. I try to resolve channel width in one way or another in my models. And otherwise, this is just a stream power model that is specific to unit area. And so I'm actually not going to couple a hydrologic model to an ecosystem's demographic model to a geomorphic model. And I understand that that is, that that is the idea of systems, and I support that kind of work. But what I'm going to show today is examples where of what I would call maybe implicit coupling. That is, rather than an explicit coupling, I'm going to make this diffusivity a function of vegetation cover, and that could be type or percent bare area, it could be multiple aspects of it. And I'm going to calibrate this value to data and look at how, look at transient natural experiments to see how things vary. So, uh, and I just want to emphasize that although I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at coupled models, so I can't do all the feedbacks, I do claim that the calibration of these values locally to these particular case studies is going to be tight. It's not ad hoc. I'm not changing things kind of willy-nilly. I have a small number of parameters, and I know exactly what they are. So this is a diffusivity. This is a, a fluvial transport efficiency, if you will, for a given um, unit, unit area and given, for a given slope, how much material is capable of moving. It's a function of grain size. It's a function of storm distribution. It's a function of many, many things, including vegetation cover on the hill slope. So in general, what I'm going to propose and show examples of is that the diffusivity goes up as the plant cover goes up because more plants equal faster bioturbation. And I'm going to argue that in most cases, this is of order one. We, we, this is kind of the, the changes that I'm going to be talking about lead to changes of, you know, a factor of two, something like that. I think what's more important is the fact that the, there's an inverse relationship between the transport coefficient and the vegetation cover such that fewer plants equals more runoff for the same rainfall and even more importantly, more bare area acting as sediment sources. And this, an example that I'm going to show, is, uh, is larger by about an order of magnitude relative to this effect. So I'm going to take you to Walnut Gulch, Gulch Experimental Watershed where a nice natural experiment has been set up in the late Holocene. This is, the, the upper half of the watershed is grassland, and the lower half of the watershed below 1,430 meters above sea level is a shrubland today. We know from Mins, however, that this portion of the landscape was a grassland until 2,000 years ago. So we have a case where we have a portion of the landscape that is grassland throughout the Holocene, and we have a late Holocene transition from this to something new that has a much larger percent bare area. There's, so we have a natural experiment set up where there's similar uplift and relief. So the tectonic setting is similar between there's no active faults that are cutting and creating large changes through here. But, uh, and the precipitation is slightly lower at lower elevation, which is typically the case for these elevation gradients in the west. But it's a small difference, 10% lower. The sediment yield and the erosion rate is 30 times higher in the shrubland than it is in the grassland. 
which isn't too surprising. I mean, we cover grass all over the landscape. It's hard to get soil off of the landscape. And you go, if you change that to a shovel and type landscape, you're going to change drainage density. You're going to start removing soil. And in fact, we see that the AV horizon that is well developed in all of this landscape is completely stripped from this landscape. So there are soil indicators that indicate how much erosion has taken place. And we see also significant changes in drainage density and also stream channel concavity. So I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail, but the essence of this is a vegetation change. This is our control setting, if you will, and this is our transient experiment. Another nice thing about Walnut Gulch is that my friends Mary and Mark and their colleagues going back in time have built state-of-the-art rooms and are actually measuring every grain of sand despite the extreme episodicity of sediment transport in this environment. They're actually trapping everything and measuring those volumetric sediment fluxes in a way that's very useful for me as a modeler. They also have grain size information, so there's a lot of information here. And I'm just plotting the total volumetric sediment flux in this case as a function of drainage area. Area. And so I'm going to be calibrating a sediment transport model. One could do area and slope if you want. But the key thing is that because they have a range of drainage areas that have these blooms, and because they have them in the shrubland and in the grassland, and they notice this huge change, we can look at vegetation cover and we can also look at how erosion rates vary as a function of spatial scale. This is unique data in the world, at least for semi arid environments. So the drainage density varies a great deal. This is just a LIDAR DEM, and, and the, it's not showing up particularly well here. But these are these instrumented watersheds in the Lucky Hills area. This is the Kendall area. There's less instrumentation over here because less is going on, for one thing. Um, but if you just take that LIDAR DEM and you extract the channel network, you can get a drainage density, or if you prefer to think about it, the mean distance from a topographic divide to the first valley head. And it's about 15 meters in the shrublands. That is, the fluvial system is much more finely dissecting the landscape compared to about 16 meters in the grasslands. That's one of the main features. So what I've done in a recent paper here uh, with Mark and Mary, this is Easter of 2016, is I have modeled drainage density as a balance between fluvial excavation of the valley head and colluvial infilling of the valley head. So there's a competition between those two things. One can set up a mass balance equation, set of equations. And so at valley heads, the fluvial erosion rate must exceed the colluvial deposition rate, because the loposin is positive in that, in that place. It must exceed the, the, um, the colluvial deposition rate by an amount equal to the net erosion rate of the landscape. So there's a total erosion rate, there's a fluvial erosion term, there's a colluvial deposition term, and if one models the channel head or the valley head in detail, including the channel width, then one can predict the drainage density and the drainage density variation through time following this transition from grassland to shrubland. And so what I've got here is just a map. This is a function of distance from the divide, and I've got the magnitude of fluvial erosion, colluvial deposition, and I've got the total erosion rate down here. I'm not going to take you in detail through all the curves. I just want to note that one can predict with some accuracy using, I think, a model that has no free parameters at all. It's tightly coupled using the available data at Walnut Gulch. One can predict this uh, length scale of 15 meters for the shrubland and 60 to 65 meters uh, for, for the grassland. So this is a prediction of drainage density as a function of vegetation cover and time. Just another example that I want to touch on, this is if you go to uh, high elevation, the Tibetan Plateau, you see actually a broadly similar landscape just on steroids. This is deeply dissected landscape. If you've ever been to the area around Lhasa or other places to the west along the Yarlung Sang Po Valley, all of the landscape is absolutely hammered with gullies. And so this is what it looks like. And these gullies basically penetrate partway at the landscape. They're vertically walled. It does look like recent incisions. So a number of years ago, I went to the fan deposits that are at the base of these gullies, did OSL dating, and we were able to bracket this incision event from between 5,000 years before President, 1,000 years before President. And this coincides with the onset of pastoralism in Tibet. So, and there's no known climate change or vegetation change at this time that would lead to this kind of event. So we think, and we proposed in this paper, that the increase in drainage density and the increase in stream channel con con concavity was a function of overgrazing 
due to this anthropogenic effect. And so we pr produced some numerical models at the time that, that show that a transient increase in K, that fluvial erodibility coefficient, can reproduce both the long, long profile and the, the map view changes geomorphically. I want to come back to the southwestern west and think a little bit more about the long time scale. So here I'm plotting up all of the pack rat moving data for the Pleistocene Holocene transition in the central Mojave Desert, which is the richest source of moving data in North America. And what I'm going to take advantage of is the fact that the forests, as they go from low elevation and they retreat to higher elevation during warmer time periods, it is a time transgressive retreat. And it's one that is fairly slow. So from about 15 or 17,000 years before present to about 9,000 years before present, the forests only retreated by 250 meters. And then they went up much faster. Now, clearly, there are multiple ways. This is juniper is abundant, and this is juniper is absent. So I'm using the pinion juniper forest as my uh, transition point between the shrubland and the forest. There are other ways to, to, to track the, the, the biome shift to higher elevations, but this is what I've chosen here. And so I've integrated this curve into a numerical model because what I want to do is predict. I want to test this hypothesis by predicting aggradation on fans downstream from source regions that are forced in this way. So this is a map that makes a prediction everywhere in the Mojave Desert for the timing of onset of aggradation due to Pleistocene Holocene transitions upslope from that location. So it's using essentially a flow routing algorithm combined with the data that I just showed you to make a prediction about the onset. And there's some details about, I made some assumptions about, you know, exactly when the source region was undergoing a transition to the cause the, 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 the triggering. Uh, and there are some details uh, in the paper, and I'd be happy to talk more about it. But in general, basically, you get earlier predicted deposition when the source region upstream from you is at lower elevation and later deposition when it's, when it's, uh, when it's at higher elevation. And so this is a, a comparison to optically stimulated luminescence ages that are low in what I call the Q3A stratigraphy. That is the stratigraphy that is the primary depositional event during the Pleistocene Holocene transition. And the, the open circles are the, the, um, the model predictions, and the black ones are the OSL ages at the same site. So there is a nice general trend. And there's some differences, and some of the ages are just maximum ages, uh, um, not because of the stratigraphic context that they're in. But there's a pretty good trend towards later deposition onset uh, at higher elevations. And I also want to make one more point without getting too much in the weeds in this particular example. Uh, when you look on sands, you, it's interesting that you can actually get two terraces from one sediment pulse. And so I want to emphasize that when you look at Pleistocene and Holocene transition terraces in the southwestern United States, we actually see two. There's a Q3A and a Q3B. The Q3A is the timing that I just documented. The Q3B is inset into that deposit and occurs much later. It's a mid Holocene age typically deposit. And so the modeling that I've done can predict both the Q3A time and the Q3B time. So the point here is that the decrease in vegetation cover, the increase in percent bare ground, triggers an increase in drainage density. The pulse is sediment. So what's happening is that the fluvial system is expanding. Hollows that were storing colloidal sediment are now forced to other channels. They're flushing sediment like a fire hose down on these fan systems. They're causing a pulse of sediment to the fans, overwhelming the fan systems, causing evulsion. Uh, and when the sediment supply is increasing, that's when fan building takes place. When the sediment supply is declining, the fan head entrenches, the channel narrows like crazy, and it actually reworks a lot of the sediment from the primary zone into the distal zone. So this is two terraces from one response. Okay? And so we always see the Q3B inset into the Q3A. So there's a very specific map relationship that we can use to test this model. And also we can make predictions about the timing of deposition and abandonment of the surface. And this one as well, the one that's inset that represents the waning phase of the sediment pulse. So I'm now testing this in other areas around the southwestern United States. Just an unsolved problem that I'd like to throw out to some ambitious graduate student. This is the lower Colorado, Colorado River. Okay, and it's integrating a very large watershed, obviously, so there are interesting questions about what might be happening. But the stratigraphy is pretty well known, and I just want to point out that there are three time periods in the last five million years where more than a thousand cubic kilometers of sediment has been stored along the lower Colorado River. 
Okay, so these are huge aggregation events. Why? Because, well, this is 300 meters vertically. It's 500 kilometers long. It's 30 kilometers wide. I mean, this is a huge area that's undergoing major aggregation. There's no literature on this problem whatsoever. There's no interpretation. I don't think there's tectonics going on. It's significant. Some people argue for a pyrogenic uplift of the, of, the, of the Colorado Rockies, potentially driving something like this. I think it's quite related to climate change. I have my own ideas, and I've been testing these things. But I think this is a good modeling target, one that is ambitious, obviously, because of the scale of the problem. But it's so important. Basically, this is the Colorado River aggrading 300 meters, coming back down to its modern level, re-aggrading, re-incising, re-aggrading again multiple times. In, and we're talking huge volumes of sediment here. The stratigraphy is well known, the dating is well known, there's no interpretation. So, moving to shorter time scales, I want to talk just a little bit about wildfire. And so, wildfire is, of course, one mechanism of removing vegetation catastrophically. We're seeing big wildfires around the western United States, and I've been interested through the CZO program in looking at the effects of wildfire on landscapes. And one of the things we found is that when you measure erosion rates that are wildfire affected, and that are non-wildfire affected. So this is a high severity wildfire, Los Conscious 2011. These are non-wildfire affected regions before the fire. We do cosmogenic radiant slides and detrital sediments, and we do other long-term erosion rate studies. You can run the numbers, and you can show that wildfire is responsible for 99% of all sediment exported from the, these watersheds over geologic time scales. So essentially nothing is happening in the absence of wildfire. In the few years following a high severity wildfire, that's where everything takes place geomorphically. So this is an idea of hot moments. Things are extremely episodic. I'm not saying that this is true everywhere in the world. This is specific to the, to the, the Valles Caldera area. But in high elevation forested watersheds where there's not a lot of sediment being exported in the absence of disturbance, disturbance is critically important. A few years ago, I started working at the global scale, and it was actually really opening, and it, was, it really opened my eyes to the fact that um, if you work at the global scale, people care about what you're doing. Usually, I write a paper, and nobody reads it, nobody cites it, right? And so, this is a case where I was interested in sediment fluxes, and James Sawitzki has worked on this for many, many years. So, I produced a model that had, I think, some things that, that I, I thought were important, like soil texture and vegetation cover, and the, the river profile. Globally, every, every river in the world has a longitudinal profile where settling takes place along that profile. Profile. And so this is just an example of sort of the baseline case without anthropogenic effects. This is with anthropogenic effects included in agriculture, basically. And it shows a major increase in sediment yield by about a factor of 30 globally and a shift from the western United States to the eastern and midwestern United States due to that anthropogenic effect. So this is just an example, but I, I produced this paper and started hearing from the Earth's the modeling community and got really excited about the fact that they cared about people who are asking, people like me, geomorphologists, who are asking questions at the global scale. So I started talking to them about Earth's the modeling, and they said, well, you know, we always assume that soil depth of bedrock is, is two meters everywhere in the world. Doesn't, doesn't that work? You know, is that, that going to do it? And I said, well, you know, first of all, really, there's things like satellite that are below the soil. That was news to, to some of them. And so, basically, I, I, I started a project to do something better than a two-meter global average. I'm not sure that this is the best available data in the world, but it was my attempt over several years to create a map of depth to paralytic material, so not necessarily fresh bedrock. But I make there's several layers in this data, database, which is now available in James. And um, so this is the average soil. So in uplands, you've got a few meters above bedrock. And then in lowlands, of course, you have large sedimentary deposits like the Ogallala Formation, the lower Mississippi. So this is an integration of geologic data and models, models that began in the CZO program at the watershed scale. And within a few years, and then within the time scale of this project, this data, these data, are now used in CLM. So this is an example of a CZO product that began at, you know, in the mountains of Arizona, and over the course of a few years went global, and CLM, the best land model in the world, was modified to accept this data, and this data is in CLM. 
So this is not an idea of how, you know, this is an example of how CZO research, as one particular example, has had a direct impact on the quality of the best care system model in the world. I think I can say that because we're here in Boulder. Okay, so it's an example, and, um, but I think it was very exciting for me. So there's actually two papers. One is on the data set. There's also another paper in the journal of climate that shows the impact on the results of CLM by doing variable depth of bedrock. So I just want to touch very briefly on the issue of, of the colonial transport trend because I've been focusing on the, the, the strength problem and I've been focusing on the sediment yield and the fluvial component. So I just want to say very briefly that, that Luke McGuire, um, a former student of mine, has been looking at cinder cones across an elevation gradient from Arizona to, to, to Oregon. And cinder cones are nice because they're radiometrically dated, and they typically start off steep with a nice uh, initial condition. They're like big anthills, right? And so they're at the angle of the pose, and over time they develop soils. And so there's a soil component to this study. And they also evolve the topography primarily by co processes, okay, by, by, by dry gravel and by, by various landsliding processes. So what he was able to show, without going into all the details, is that looking at the development of asymmetry over time and relating that to the potential controlling factors, he was able to show that if the vegetation density on north versus south, south facing slope, not today, but actually at, at, in, in a glacial climate that controls the aspect development of these cones. So if you're in a, if you're in a Pleistocene cone like this, this is 300,000 years old, most of its life was not spent in a Holocene climate. It was spent in a near glacial climate because of the asymmetry of the, of, of the global temperature curve. Most of the Pleistocene is not like today. It's like that other time period. So when you look at vegetation cover as a function of elevation in Arizona, this is the current setup where there's more plants on the north facing slope. Well, at, at LGM, that was actually reversed. And that's critically important for explaining the asymmetry. So we argue that the data, and it's a host of data using slope aspect and also drainage density, can only be explained by an increase in this diffusion coefficient with biomass. So some conclusions for you. Um, common vegetation can changes can trigger order of magnitude increases in erosion rates and topographic metrics. In coastal fluvial systems, and I, I, I should say that I have a version of this talk that has wind erosion because I do wind erosion work as well, but I just focused on coastal fluvial systems um, due to the time constraints. An increase in fluvial erodibility coefficient reproduces the first order behavior, i.e., a transient increase in drainage density and channel convexity with a resulting pulse of aggradation on fans, which we can study and date. More vegetation cover can increase the coveal 7 transport, but this affects the, uh, seems to be of smaller magnitude in cases that I've studied anyway. And global scale or system models and dynamic vegetation models can be used to determine future hotspots of geomorphic change. Such models can require, uh, they require better component models and input data on geomorphology, and we as geomorphologists can contribute to that. Thank you very much. Or um, on the stream floor. No. Uh, so now that you have the rub or this and this, and you have this data set, I'm really curious if you could test this sort of ideas of maybe vegetation may have that type of precision decision, but also, or maybe more in that type of region, uh, more aspect the critical sort of thing. Are you yeah. thinking about it? Or? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, I was doing the simplest possible modulation of those empirical coefficients. I think in the cinder cone problem, it's sort of interesting. When the only case study that I talked about that's really sensitive to the critical angle is the cinder cone problem, the one that I talked about at the end, because they start off exactly at the angle of repose. It's a volcanoclastic deposit. It's a tepid fallout. And so it is a sand pile, truly. And it does depend sensitively on uh, the SFC value, but it takes quite a while, about 100,000 years, for a forest to develop. 
because in the beginning, these cones are just absolutely porous. It's gravity drainage all the way through. So you need to have enough, you know, enough dust input to the surface to actually nucleate runoff and to actually support plants. And so that's just another component of the problem. I'm not dismissing your concern. I'm just saying that at least over the first 100,000 years or so, there's not a lot of vegetation cover to speak of because there's not a lot of soil development. So while they're sitting right at that sensitive slopes and they're sitting right near S and C and there is a lot of nonlinear colloidal sediment transport. I'm not sure that vegetation is going to control S and C because there isn't a lot of vegetation present in the early time period of the cones. But your, your broader point is well taken. But yes. That'd be yeah. uh, an interesting feedback. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You said forests don't take a lot of time to grow, but it depends on what the climate was exactly at that point because the plants adapt and probably we're not looking at this right. Right, because if you look at Omar Yetama in 2015, he actually solved this problem using child, like a landscape evolution model, uh, based on Arkan's 2005 paper, which talks about vegetation and its impact on the bacterial erosion and not in south facing slopes, how they differ. Uh, on north slopes, you have episodic erosion. We can look at that as a B, as a function of B, but I don't think bioperturbation is the only reason. That. Maybe it's because you grow up the amount of, well, you can save more moisture on the north side, uh, not taking slopes, so you grow a forest, but at one point you see that it cannot sustain the weight, so it just episodically goes down. I probably everyone knows this, but I'm just saying, probably that's the reason why you see a D as a function of V is fine if you look at a long term view, but on a short term view, it might show you the reverse because. There's continuous fuel erosion on the south facing slope because of radiation. There's no plants, there are no trees. Let's see, so you have fluvial erosion. Do you have any insight on? Well, I, um, yeah, I mean, you're going to come to my slope aspect workshop, right? <laughs> I should come. Yeah, I think you are coming, right? So, yeah, no, I mean, it's so right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that um, I'm not sure how to answer your question. I'm just, uh, but but I would say that um, yeah, I think we should we should talk after you know maybe about the specific details and this question of time still you're raising. I, you know, I, I'm I'm trying to um, I I don't know this is one answer for all field studies, and so I, you know I, I think that. The, the models that are produced are, are motivated by these specific field studies and patterns and data. I mean, I don't start with a model. I always start with data, what is the pattern, and then iteratively try to sort of marry the two in a way that is still, you know, a good test of, of, of the model. And I'm not trying to, to, you know, to force the model into the data, but I'm, it's, I mean, it's, it is always iterative. And so um, if I consider a broader range of sites, then I might come to a different clue, conclusion. So, um, as a follow-up to that, I'm curious, what you, you mentioned at the beginning, the value of this one data set as it's catching them comparing the vegetative or the grassland versus the shrubland. What additional data could be collected that would be most impactful to help constrain these models of landscape evolution in various settings? Yeah. I think um, that's a good question. I mean, I think that uh, in my the short answer is that I don't have a lot of good data on how the diffusivity, the diffusion coefficient, varies at Walnut Gulch specifically. I have tried to look at, you know, to assume a steady state and look at ridge top curvature, which is a sort of standard approach that comes from, you know, the UK group and, and whatnot. And I, I had a hard time finding um, the systematic results from that sort of thing. And it could be that it's just not in steady state. It could be that uh, the landscape is also undergoing a tilt style uplift that's different from what we usually assume in landscape evolution models, the block style uplift. So 
um, I think that there's a lot to be done in uh, serious landscape evolution modeling of walnut gulch in particular, and I'm not going to do it all. I'm just sort of maybe the, one of the first people to get there, and I tackled this particular drainage density problem using this vegetation change as a, as a hook, but uh, there's a whole lot more to do. It's a great place, and they have data on channel width. If you're interested in channel width, I mean, they've measured to an, anything you want. They've probably measured it, and, uh, and so it's, it's, a huge, it's a great resource. I think many people know this, and proposals are being written as we speak in that space. Thank you. Thank you.